Okay, so let's continue on page 140. List common vascular conditions or disorders. So vascular conditions and disorders can be hard for clients to deal with. So it's important to understand the types to better help your client. As mentioned earlier, these types of vascular lesions may be considered territory lesions. So we have read and also have spoken about rosacea, right? In the last few weeks. So rosacea, you want to highlight and put a star next to the first two sentences. Rosacea is an inflammatory and vascular disorder with multiple causes that are not completely understood, okay? It is a progressive disorder that starts with flushing and increasing bouts of redness. Visible ves vessels and skin sensitivity are symptoms. The symptoms can progress to pustular type breakouts that can be confused with acne. Rosacea can affect the eyes as well, causing chronic bloodshot eyes, some clear to yellow, yellowish discharge and irritation. In advanced cases, the rosacea can cause skin thickening, particularly around the nose. Uh, these symptoms is called rhinophema. You guys remember that? Uh, rosacea can be challenging to treat because of its unclear origin. Heredity, bacteria, the uh, dermodex mite, and fungus are possible theories. Certain factors are known to aggravate the condition, um, vasodil vasodilation um, of the blood vessels make rosacea a little bit worse. Spicy foods, alcohol, caffeine, extreme temperatures, heat, sun, and stress aggravate rosacea symptoms. Treating rosacea, just like acne, estheticians can treat the symptoms of rosacea but cannot cure the disorder. Symptom management is the goal when working with a rosacea client. Do you guys remember some of the, man, maybe protocol, what things you can avoid with uh, someone that has rosacea or what not to do? Steam. Steam, right? Heat. Heat. Um, what about massage, right? Correct. Not exfoliating aggressively. Mm -hmm. Yep. Rosacea treatments should include a collaboration with medical professionals. Antifungal prescription skincare products uh, may help. Skin calming ingredients, right? Treatments will help decrease the inflammation, providing soothing facials with gentle massage and light exfoliation. Limit the use of steam, adding high frequency to uh, oxygenate the skin can help. Some advanced aesthetic procedures with lasers, intense pulse light, also known as IPL, and radio frequency devices can also be effective. Then we have telangiectasia. It is a visible capillaries from 0.5 to one millimeter in diameters that are commonly uh, found on the face, particularly around the nose, cheeks, and chin. They can appear due to injury, again, hereditary, a rosacea, hormonal changes, or exposure to extreme cold or heat. A matting of tiny telangiectasia creates a, a, a rooty complexion called coporose, basically red, right? Red skin. Ch telangiectasia is a cosmetic irregularity and it is not a, a medical condition. Then we have varicose veins, uh, which is I think what we were mentioning, um, Diana. So varicose veins are visible vascularity that are abnormally dilated and twisted veins that can occur anywhere in the body put a star next to that they are found on the legs pregnancy extended period of time standing standing for too long and sitting and genetics are contributing factors of varicose veins sometimes treatments with uh, sclerotherapy uh, an injection into the vein with a solution that causes the vein to collapse can cause smaller vessels to disappear. Varicose veins are a condition that should be treated by a medical professional. Such treatments could include surgery for larger twisted uh, vessels. Page 142 at the top, identifying pigment disorders. Okay, so this is where it gets even more interesting. So the genetic background of a person influences pigmentation disorders. Abnormal pigmentation, referred to as dyschromia, you guys, can be caused by various internal and external factors. Hyperpigmentation is overproduction of pigment, meaning color, right? Hypo, with the O, hypopigmentation, is lack of pigment. In the two types of pigmentation disorders, 
Sun exposure is the biggest external cause of pigmentation disorders and can make existing pigmentation disorders worse. Drugs may also cause skin pigmentation abnormalities. Hyperpigmentation is a frequent concern for clients and it is obviously discussed in other chapters. So let's talk about hyperpigmentation. Please highlight the word melasma, okay? Melasma is a type of hormonal hyperpigmentation disorder that first appears during pregnancy with the use of birth control pills. Melasma has an identifiable pattern of a solid, fairly symmetrical hyperpigmentation, often on the forehead, cheeks, upper lip, and chin. I actually like to say that melasma does obviously appear on the cheeks, and I feel like it has what I call a butterfly effect, okay? So usually melasma appears in like larger, it's, it's a larger areas in the face, okay? Addressing the symptoms of melasma can be challenging for an esthetician. The pigmentation can fade, and this is what we were talking about, Diana, it can fade during the times of low UV exposure. Hormones returning to normal levels after pregnancy will alleviate the pigmentation. The, uh, excuse me, the consistent use of melanocytes inhibiting skincare products as well as sunscreen application is essential. Remember we, we talked a little bit about um, melanin inhibiting products that are called tyrosinase inhibitors, okay? Products that contain tyrosinase inhibitors are going to help with slowing down the overproduction of pigment in the skin, okay? So, um, excuse me, a series of chemical peels can lighten the pigmentation. Some high energy laser devices with nanosecond of, um, of uh, picoseconds technology and fractional radio frequency treatments can offer visible improvements. You guys, melasma is a condition that requires management. There is no cure. So it's a constant battle with pigmentation. Like I have expressed to you guys that I have uh, some pigmentation on my cheek and you guys know that I don't mind spending a good <coughs> amount of money on good professional skincare products, but it's something that I have to work at it on a daily. So there's, and uh, put a star next to the word uh, lentigo. Lentigo is a flat pigmented area similar to a freckle. Okay, you see the picture there? Okay, so look at hyperpigmentation. Hyperpigmentation, again, they're like smaller. Then you have melasma. Look how larger it is on the face, on the skin. That picture, is that just like a case of severe melasma? Yeah, that's pretty severe. Like, mm -hmm. It's pretty severe, but honestly, right where it's at, usually that's where women get it. You see how it's on the nose, on the cheeks, and then here on the chin, even on the upper lip? But that is pretty severe. Here's the thing. Some, some even call it the pregnancy mask. So women sometimes even like their chest area darkens uh, during pregnancy. And like I mentioned earlier, it does or it can fade or go away. But if you are out and in being exposed to UV radiation in the sun, that it can get worse and then you're kind of like stuck with it, right? So you, it's important to treat it right away. So again, lentigo is a small freckle, small yellow brown spot. Lentigens are multiple pigmented lesions. Medical professionals identify lentigens that result from sunlight exposure as actinic or solar lentigens. Some clients may call them age spots as they associate it with aging skin. Who yes, yes. And then hyperpigmentation has this like darker spots. And they just from you you can get that from sun exposure and obviously if if those blemishes can turn obviously into hyperpigmentation there's also what's called post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation which are again darker spots left after an act like a breakout are there for both? that it's going to be similar because the goal is eventually the same to get rid of it i mean you want to know the difference of course but as far as treatment the goal will be the same oh. as far as products Anything that, again, that has uh, tyrosinase inhibitors, the use of kojic acid, um, 
licorice uh, root extract, obviously the use of vitamin C, um, exfoliating the skin, doing using enzymes on the client, microdermabrasion, exfoliating Are we gonna the go skin. Over all that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, these are all treatments. Yes, we are going to go over all of that for sure. All right, on page 143, I have the word nevus. I like that. Nevus is also known as a birthmark. Okay, is it, it is a malformation of the skin from abnormal pigmentation or dilated capillaries that is present at birth or appears shortly after birth. Um, highlight this and put a star next to it. A port wine stain is a vascular type of nevus. Is an example of a pigmented nevus. Is an example of a vascular nevus. Okay, so there you have, uh, look at the pictures, an example of a pigmented nevus and then um, a vascular port wine stain nevus, which is more red. Anyone have one of those? Um, oh, look, we were just talking about this, uh, Amy. Post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, it is darkened pigmentation due to an injury to the skin or the residual healing after acne lesions has resolved. It is often deep red, purple, or brown in appearance. Again, that is all going to be based on your skin tone, right? So with me, because I consider myself to be in the Fitzpatrick scale, maybe type four, um, once uh, acne has healed, I'm left with more of a brown spot. Miss Esmeralda, for instance, she's very fair. She could be definitely a one. So she's left what? Red. Red, Red. Yeah. exactly. Okay. So on uh, bottom of page 143, highlight and put a star next to the word tan. Tan results from exposure to the sun. Tanning is a change in pigmentation due to melanin production as a defense against UV radiation that damages the skin. A tan is basically visible skin and, uh, and cell damage. All right, so we talked about hyperpigmentation. Now we will talk about hypopigmentation, which is lack of color, okay? So hyper, hypopigmentation occurs in various forms, you guys. It is seen less commonly than hyperpigmentation disorders you know, feel like everyone will say, well, I've had or I have hyperpigmentation versus a lot of hypopigmentation. All right, so highlight and put a star next to the word leucoderma. So leucoderma is a loss of pigmentation leading to light abnormal patches of depigmented skin. Vitiligo and albinism is a type of leucodermas, okay? Albinism. It is a rare genetic condition characterized by lack of melanin pigment in the body, including the skin, hair, eyes. Um, a person is at very high risk of skin cancer, is sensitive to light, and ages early without the normal melanin protection. Uh, the technical term for albinism is congenital leucoderma or congenital hypopigmentation. Vitiligo is a pigmentation disease characterized by white irregular patches of the skin that are totally lacking pigment, okay? A, the condition can worsen with time in sunlight. The disease can occur at any age. And it is believed to be an autoimmune disorder causing an absence of melanocytes, which is the pigment carrying cell, okay? Which is out. But it might be tinea vesicolor, also called as pityriasis versicolor, which is a more of a fungal condition that inhibits uh, melanin production. This is not contagious, you guys, because it is, it is caused by yeast, a normal part of the human skin. It is characterized by white, brown, and look at the picture, white, uh, brown, or like a salmon color flaky patches. Sun exposure can stimulate the growth of the fungus, this fungus can be treated with antifungal cream or other medication. Selenium sulfides shampoos like Celsius Blue, for instance, can also treat the condition. High humidity and summer heat stimulate the condition. It usually fades in cold winter seasons and reoccurs with warmer weather. To the lay person, tinea vesicolor can be uh, misinterpreted as vitiligo, so refer to a medical professional um, is important. Now let's uh, describe the different types of dermatitis. 
I know these pictures are a little out there. We're on page Ooh. 145. <laughs> Dermatitis, you guys, is a generalized term to refer to an anti-inflammatory condition of the skin. Various forms include lesions such as eczema, vesicles, or papules. Dermatitis has many forms, and symptoms of, uh, of one form can be confused with symptoms of another form. Referral to a medical professional is recommended for appropriate diagnosis. Types of dermatitis or inflammation of the skin include the following. We have contact dermatitis. Occupational disorders from ingredients in cosmetics and chemical solutions can cause contact dermatitis. Contact with allergens and acoustic chemicals can also cause skin sensitivity or disorders. Allergies and skin eruptions are common. Wearing gloves, obviously protective skin creams while working with chemicals or irritating substances can help prevent contact dermatitis, okay? Look at the dermatitis on the face. And then we have allergic contact dermatitis. Um, it is caused by exposure to and direct skin contact with an allergen. Normally the immune system protects us from pathogens and disease, but with an allergic reaction, the immune system causes the problem by trying to do its job too well. An allergic reaction occurs when the, our immune system mistakes uh, a benign substance for a toxic one and in, initiates a major defense against it. Initial exposure to an allergen does not always cause an allergic reaction. The development of hypersensitivity is a result of repeated exposure to an allergen over time. This process is called sensitization and it may take months or even years depending on the allergen um, and the intensity of the exposure. Also remember that different people develop allergies at different allergens. Individuals' predispositions to allergies may be inherited. Sensitivity seems to run in families. Contact dermatitis and red itchy skin can be caused by an allergic reaction or contact with an irritant such as these common allergens. We have makeup, obviously skincare products, detergent, and even some dyes. Do you guys know that for sure? Atopic dermatitis. So atopic dermatitis is a chronic relapsing form of dermatitis, you guys. Irritants and allergens trigger reactions that include dry, cracked skin and redness, itching, dehydration of the dermatitis make the condition obviously worse. Use of humidifiers and lotions can help keep the skin more hydrated. Topical corticosteroids can relieve the symptoms. Then you have eczema. Oh my goodness, that looks like it hurts so bad. Look at the eczema on the hands. It's an inflammatory, painful, itching disease of the skin. It is acute or chronic in nature. It has dry or moist lesions. A client with eczema should be referred to a doctor. Avoid contact and skin care treatments if a client has eczema. Uh, absolutely, if someone has eczema and they're having an active breakout, you do not want to do any type of treatment on them, okay? Um, irritant contact dermatitis. So everyone comes in contact with an irritant and um, is affected by irritant reactions. Although the degree of irritation will vary depending on you, right? And every individual is different. In acute cases, symptoms are noticed immediately or within just a few hours. Chronic cases may be delayed uh, reactions that take weeks, sometimes even months or years to develop. Symptoms range from redness, swelling, scaling, and itching to serious painful chemical burns. Highlight the following and put a star next to it. Irritating substances temporarily damage the epidermis. Caustic substances are examples of, um, of irritants. So when the skin is damaged by irritating substances, the immune system, again, springs into action. It floods the tissue with water, trying to dilute the irritant. Therefore, swelling happens, okay? And you can see the picture there on page 146, figure 419. Um, the immune system also releases histamines, which uh, enlarge the vessels around the injury. Blood can then rush to the area um, more quickly and help remove the ir irritating substance. The extra blood under the skin is easily visible. The entire area becomes red and warm, and it may even throb. Histamines cause the itchy feeling that often uh, follows contact dermatitis. 
After everything calms down, the swelling will go away. The surrounding skin is often left damaged, scaly, cracked, and even dry. Fortunately, irritants are not permanent. If you avoid repeated and or prolonged contact with an irritant substance, the skin will usually quickly repair itself. However, if you continue or repeat it, have exposure, it may lead to chronic allergies, reactions, and obviously skin damage. You may notice irritant contact dermatitis when a teen client comes in for an acne consultation. You may note um, a breakout on the client's chin and learn they play football. You may rule out the possibilities of irritant uh, contact dermatitis from the football helmet, the chin strap, before beginning the treatment plan for the acne. This one, people don't really talk about this, but it's, it's common. It's perioral dermatitis. So perioral dermatitis is an acne-like condition that happens around the mouth, okay? Uh, consisting mainly of small clusters of papules, and it may be caused by toothpaste or product used on the face. It is not contagious. Antibiotics obviously can uh, help treat the condition. You guys, we have seborrheic dermatitis, again, 147. Please highlight and put a star next to it. Seborrheic dermatitis is a form of eczema, you guys, characterized by inflammation, dry or oily, scaly, or crusting, or even itchiness. The red flaky skin often appears in the eyebrow or on the scalp and along the hairline, in the middle of the forehead and along the sides of the nose. Uh, one cause is inflammation of the sebaceous glands. This condition is sometimes treated, again, with cortisone creams. Severe cases should be referred to a dermatologist. Okay. Then you have stasis dermatitis. It's caused by poor circulation in the lower legs that can create a chronic inflammatory state. The legs may sometimes have uh, ulcerations, ulcerations along with uh, scaly skin, itching, and hyperpigmentation. A client with this type of skin disorder needs a cardiovascular referral. Even when the circulatory issues are resolved, some uh, hemosiderin staining can remain. Advanced aesthetic treatments like IPL can help improve the appearance. 48, identify the types of hypertrophies, okay? So hypertrophy, you guys, is defined as an abnormal growth. Many, again, are benign or harmless. However, some growths are premalignant and malignant that can be dangerous or even cancerous. The term hypertrophic is used to describe thickening of a tissue. The opposite of hypertrophy or is atrophy, which means wasting away or thinning, okay? Uh, keloids are an example of a hypertrophy. Types of hypertrophies include the following. Hyperkeratosis, it is thickening of the skin caused by mass of keratinocytes. Then we have the word keratoma, which is an acquired thickened patch of epidermis. A callus would be uh, caused by pressure or friction it is a keratoma. If the thickening also grows inward, then it becomes what? A corn on the skin. Keratosis. Keratosis is an, again, an abnormally thick buildup of skin cells. This is very common. Chicken skin, right? That's what they call it. Strawberry legs. Keratosis pilaris. Keratosis pilaris, redness and bumpiness in the cheeks, upper arms, or thighs caused by block follicles. It has the appearance of chicken skin. We notice and see this after you have waxed someone, okay? Um, a, a really good lotion that um, I've heard does really, really good. It's called Amlactin, A-M-L-A-C-T-I-N, Amlactin. I think that's how you spell it. Um, you can find it at like a local drugstore and it's about 30 bucks a bottle, but I heard that it really does help with keratosis pilaris. Okay, it is not well understood, you guys, but it is often genetic and disappears after the age of 30. Many young women feel self conscious about the condition and will seek an esthetician's help. Topical chemical exfoliation that keeps the follicles free of keratin, like an AHA or a BHA product, along with light uh, mechanical exfoliation that can help unblock follicles and alleviate the rough feeling. So, exfoliating, exfoliation will help. Um, maybe even waxing versus shaving will help. 
Care must be taken to prevent too aggressive an approach and disturb the acid mantle balance, causing dermatitis or some sort of an infection. Okay. So again, it's called keratosis pilaris. Yeah. A mole, again, is just a pigmented nevus, which is a brownish spot ranging in colors. Moles, uh, excuse me, from tan to bluish black. Some are flat, resembling freckles. Others are raised and darker. Most are benign, uh, but changes in moles or colors and even shapes, obviously they need to be checked by a doctor uh, just to make sure that uh, nothing is cancerous, okay? Put a star next to psoriasis. It's an itchy skin disease characterized by red patches covered with white silver scales. Remember that? White silver scales. <laughs> okay. Caused by the over proliferation of skin cells that replicate too fast. Psoriasis is usually found in patches on the scalp, elbows, knees, chest, and lower back. Okay. Skin tags. Small outgrowth or extension of the skin that looks like a little flap. They're benign and are common under the arms, on the neck, or breast area caused by friction. They're very common under the arm, on the underarm area. The term contagious disease is used interchangeably with the terms infectious or communicable disease. Do not perform services on anyone, you guys, with a contagious disease because it can spread and infect others. Refer them to a medical professional. The following are contagious diseases. Put a star next to conjunctivitis, also known as pink eye. Inflammation of the mucous membrane around the eye due to chemical, bacterial, or viral causes. Very contagious, you guys. It can be treated with antibiotics. Then we have herpes simplex virus one. <laughs> Fever blisters or colds, put a star next to that one. Fever blisters or cold sores, recurring viral infection, a vesicle or group of vesicles on red swollen base. The blisters usually appear on the lips or nostrils. Herpes simplex virus 1 causes cold sores and lesions around the mouth. It is a contagious disease treated with antiviral medication to shorten the outbreak. Now herpes simplex virus 2, uh, which will be genital herpes, you guys, Never work on clients with an active herpes lesions. Peels, waxing, or other stimuli may cause a breakout. Even if the condition is not currently active, the virus can be spread to another area on the person that is infected or to, the, to other people. This is an example of why reviewing the client intake form is important. All we hope is that clients are honest, right? It's, it's, yeah, how do you really, really know 100%? Put a star next to the following. Two stars, I guess this is two questions in one. Herpes zoster, also known as shingles, okay? It is a painful skin condition due to the reactivation of the chicken pox virus, mm -hmm. also known as the varicella zoster virus. Shingles is a viral infection of the sensory nerve characterized by a group of red blisters that form a rash that occurs in a ring or line. The rash is typically confined to one side of the body. VZV can cause nerve and organ damage along with severe pain that can last for months or years. Treatment includes antiviral drugs to shorten the length of the outbreak. This is uh, Impetigo. Impetigo, a bacterial infection of the skin that often occurs in children. Again, correct, uh, characterized by clusters of small blisters or crusty lesions filled with bacteria. It is extremely contagious. Oral and topical antibiotics are used in treatment. An un untrained eye may misinterpret impedigo and assume it's herpes, acne, or even dermatitis. Professional medical interve intervention is the correct course of action for your client. Now, I just wanna say something. There are certain things that you may look at, and again, if it's something that's inflamed, something that is oozing, you will not touch. Whether you are able to identify what it is or not, you are not going to put yourself and other people at risk. So you can ask the question or just say, it looks like you're having a breakout. 
I don't think it is the best time for me to treat you at the moment. We have uh, onychomosis. It's a fungal, fungal infection that produces symptoms of thick, brittle, discolored nails. The fungus lives off the keratin in the nail. Onychomosis has been challenged, uh, challenging to eradicate because fungus likes to grow in dark, moist places. We know that. And shoes can be perfect environment. Okay, climate with uh, onychomosis can uh, feel clients with onychomosis can feel embarrassed about uh, the appearance of the nails and discouraged during a course of treatment because of slow nail growth. Then you have the word tinea. Tinea is a fungal infection. Okay, tinea uh, fungi feed on proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids in the skin. Tinea pedis, athlete's foot, is a fungal infection that can be treated with antifungal topical powders, sprays, or creams. Estheticians could encounter this type of infection when doing body wraps or again doing hand and foot massages with the facial. If you're reviewing a client's intake form and see the word tinea, you will know that the client has had a fungus and should be determined um, and should determine the location prior to treatment. Tinea corporis, which is also known as ringworm, is caused by fungus. It is not a, a, a worm. It looks like skin irritation that spreads into a circular infection that is red and scaly. It can be dry or moist. It can be spread by direct contact as well as, um, as indirect contact with items that have touched the skin of an infected person. Pets can carry tinea corporis. It is important to use a uh, fungicide to disinfect items that have come into contact with clients that has had the infection, including clothing, blankets, and towels. It can be treated with either oral or topical antifungals. Okay. All right. You guys, on page 152, put a star at the top of the word veruca. A veruca, you guys, is known, it's basically a wart. Okay, and that's what a wart looks like there on at the top of page 152. It is a hypertrophy of this uh, papil and epidermis caused by a virus. They're, they're not cancerous, but they are contagious. Verrucas are typically flesh color, but can be brown or black. They can appear singly or in clusters. Verrucas are not uh, well understood. They can spontaneously disappear, but there are several treatment options, including again, cryotherapy, um, electric therapy, surgical uh, incisions, and chemical exfoliation. Chemical exfoliations involve the application of a strong salicylic acid um, at home that peels the wart off in layers. So it's just starts shutting off. When treating a client with warts, it is imperative that you wear gloves to avoid spreading the virus to other locations on the client's body um, or inadvertently to uh, obviously another client. And yes, warts are very uh, contagious. Page 152, identify two mental health conditions that may manifest as skin conditions. Put a star next to it and please highlight it, okay? We have dermatillomania. It is a form of obsessive compulsive disorder, also known as OCD, in which the person picks at their skin to the point of injury, infection, or scarring. A person with dermatillia mania finds the picking stress relieving and not painful. It can often be socially isolating because severe dermatillomania can be disfiguring, you guys. Body dysphoric disorder, psychological disorder that with clients that have preoccupations with their appearance, do not have realistic picture of what they look like. To fixate on minor appearances, imperfections, and see them as disfiguring. They believe others are viewing them negatively because of their physical appearance. They may attack the mirror frequently and need an abnormal amount of reassurance that their appearance is acceptable. This is very real. They may be spa hoppers or have history of many cosmetic surgeries or treatments to fix their per their perceived flaws that may not even exist, you guys. They're dissatisfied with the outcome after treatment. This client may be challenging to manage and will require medical interventions. 
All right, you guys, we are now at the bottom of page 153. Recognize common skin conditions related to skin diseases and disorders. Skin condition in are often symptoms of more than one skin disease or skin disorder. Several of them look very similar to another. If you encounter these conditions, you will need to make an assessment and judgment about treatments. Perhaps a condition is the result of an infection or it is the appropriate clinical endpoint of an effective of an effective treatment having confidence in identifying these conditions will give you the confidence when determining a treatment plan and also giving your client confidence in your skills all right okay page 144 at the top so here are some different definitions and obviously infections uh, a furuncle a furuncle also known as a boil a subcutaneous absence filled with pus caused by bacteria in the glands or the hair follicle. A carbuncle is a group of boils. Edema, edema is simply swelling from a fluid imbalance in the cells or from a response to injury, infection, or even medication. Erythema will be retinus caused by inflammation. Folliculitis will be hair growth when the hair grows under the surface instead of growing up and out of the follicle causing a bacterial infection. Basically, folliculitis will be an ingrown hair, okay? We have sotofolliculitis. Sotofolliculitis, also known as razor bombs, resembles folliculitis without the pus or obviously the infection, okay? We have proritis as a medical term for itching, persistent itching, okay? We have steatoma. A steatoma is a sebaceous cyst or subcutaneous tumor filled with sebum range they range in sizes from a pea size to an orange okay usually appears on the scalp neck and back also called a win okay and put a star next to both of those the atoma and pruritus all right explain five pseudophorias glands disorders okay Disorders of the pseudophorous glands include the following. Anhydrosis, anhydrosis, a deficiency in perspiration due to failure of the sweat glands, often results from a fever or skin disease. Anhydrosis requires medical treatment. Then we have bromhydrosis. Bromhydrosis will be that foul smelling perspiration usually in the underarms okay armpits or on the feet bromhydrosis is caused by bacteria and yeast that break down the sweat on the surface of the skin then we have hyperhidrosis hyperhidrosis will be a chronic excessive perspiration caused by heat genetics stress or medication okay Page 155, all right. Okay, diaphoresis, excessive perspiration due to an underlying medical condition. Menopause would be an example, okay? Then we have miliaria rubra. Miliaria rubra, also known as prickly heat, an acute inflammatory disorder of the sweat glands results in the eruption of red vesicles and burning itching skin from excessive heat exposure, okay? Malaria rubra, you wanna remember that one. Recognizing a potentially contagious skin disorder can stop the spread of infection. You can formulate a more specific treatment plan and use the appropriate products when you can identify common skin disorders, such as rosacea and acne. Understanding that some skin disorders are contraindications for treatments will help you avoid a negative outcome. The medical field is progressing and treatment of the skin disorders and diseases is becoming easier with advances in technology, ingredients, and medication. Although there are hundreds of disorders and diseases, the majority of ones you may commonly encounter and discuss in this chapter along with some that are obviously very unique. Knowledge of skin problems takes years okay, of experience and study. Reference books and credible medical websites aren't helpful in identifying these disorders and diseases. 
All right, so that is the end of chapter four, diseases, disorders and diseases of the skin. Now, once again, I always bring this up after every chapter. Please do not ignore the chapter glossary, which has all the terminology. If you are indeed studying for your state board exam, I always recommend the use of flashcards to help you remember a lot of this information. I know it's a lot. I know it's a lot of terms, but all of this and understanding diseases and disorders of the skin is obviously very important as you start to actually do a more in-depth skin analysis. You want to be able to recognize what is it that you are seeing when you're doing a skin analysis, okay? Before jumping into an actual treatment plan for your clients. I know it was a very, um, the chapter wasn't too long, it wasn't too bad, but again, a lot of the information is very, very crucial that you go over it not just once, again, um, read over this as many times as you need to help it stick, okay? I hope you guys are finding this these videos helpful. And we'll see you on the next one. Bye.